Mr Speaker, members of this House secured a proper, meaningful vote for a purpose. And it was so that this House would be able to make an informed judgment on the future of our whole country. The point was not only to know the terms of the withdrawal, but also to know what the future relationship was going to look like, a future relationship to shape our economy and our constituents' jobs and livelihoods for decades to come. To consider those two things together is vital, Mr Speaker. It's what this House should rightly expect and what has always been promised, because it is central to the whole process. Article 50 itself says, and I quote, the Union shall negotiate and conclude an agreement with the State, setting out the arrangements for its withdrawal, taking account of the framework for its future relationship with the Union. Look at the withdrawal agreement. Look at Article 184 of it. It specifically refers to the political declaration and even identifies the particular document. And in their letter to the Prime Minister of the 14th of January, Presidents Juncker and Tusk said this. As for the link between the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration to which you make reference in your letter, it can be made clear that these two documents, whilst being of a different nature, are part of the same negotiated package. In order to underline the close relationship between the two texts, they can be published side by side in the official journal in a manner reflecting the link between the two as provided for in Article 50. And it's also, Mr Speaker, what the Prime Minister herself has always said. On Sophie Ridge on the 21st of November last year, this was her view. We agreed the withdrawal agreement in principle last week. The withdrawal agreement goes alongside the future relationship. It's the future relationship, she said, that actually delivers, if you like, on people's concerns in the withdrawal agreement. Yet, I, I will give way in a moment. I just finished this part of my speech. Getting that future relationship right is necessary, but nothing's agreed until everything's agreed, she says. Now, now she isn't known for her flexibility. So, unsurprisingly, on the 14th of January in this House, she said, again, the link between them means that the commitments of one cannot be banked without the commitments of the other. The EU has been clear. Let me finish this section. The EU has been clear that they come as a package. Bad faith by either side in negotiating the legal instruments that will deliver the future relationship laid out in the political declaration would be a breach of their legal obligations under the withdrawal agreement. Mr. Speaker, I will give way in a moment. Mr. Speaker, how many times have I heard the Attorney General arguing from the dispatch box when we've spoken about the backstop and the future relationship about the importance of reasonable endeavours and good faith in ensuring that we secure in good time a future trade agreement? Yet the government has now decided to remove from our consideration today in the motion, one of the documents against which you can even judge bad faith. I will uh, I'll give way to the Honourable Gentleman. The fact is, the withdrawal agreement would be accepted by the European Union. That's the first point. The second point is it sorts out the implementation period, the money, and crucially guarantees citizens' rights for my constituents, EU nationals and Brits abroad. Which part of those factors does he actually disagree with? The answer is none. Answer. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, we used to we used to say that the political declaration was so vague it was a blindfold Brexit. But what we also now know, because the Prime Minister has made clear that she intends to leave her office, is rather than it just being a blindfold Brexit, the party opposite are asking us not only to be blindfolded, but to be led into a different room by a different Tory Prime Minister. And let's be clear as well. Let's be clear as well, Mr. Speaker. It is a prime minister, ultimately chosen by Conservative Party members, who constitute a tiny part of the wider electorate. 
party opposite can talk about the national interest, it is not in the national interest for the future of our country to be decided by a Tory leadership contest. I, I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He's making uh, excellent points, and in the process, and in the process, demolishing the premise of the Attorney General's request to this House today. The Attorney General did not take my intervention, but in his speech, the Attorney General promised mechanisms and processes to Parliament to guarantee a future say. We acted in good faith in the EU Withdrawal Act with Section 13, which put both those yep. things together. Yeah, yeah. With the government today undermining that mechanism, why should we trust a word? Yeah. Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right. And let me be clear as well, Mr Speaker, we on this side will never leave a Tory Prime Minister free to rip up workers' rights and protections. To put the jobs and livelihoods of our constituents at risk on a Brexit that will be driven by ideology. And as my, as my honourable friend sets out, the motion before us today is clear, and the Attorney General is clear. It does not even pretend to meet the requirements of Section 13 of the European Union Withdrawal Act. Because that clearly. Dear, dear. I'm very grateful to our friend giving way. And in the cul-de-sac of certainty that the government are announcing today, is it not possible that they might be seeking to appeal or revoke Section 13 at some date, which would get them out of their problem? Yeah. Uh, g given, given the government's conduct of negotiations in recent years, who knows? You can rule very little out. I will give way to the honourable gentleman. To my five-a-side colleague for giving away, but will he kindly tell us which bits of the withdrawal agreement does he disagree with? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, we have always been clear the two documents have to be taken together: the political declaration and the withdrawal agreement, and the chicanery. The sh Mr. Speaker, the chicanery of this government in trying to separate them does them no credit whatsoever. The government, the government can seek to blame others as to why it can't carry out the statutory approval process in its own legislation, but we are here today, Mr Speaker, because this government has manifestly failed on its central policy over the past two years. The handling of the negotiations has been, frankly, disastrous. Now, the Prime Minister took office in July 2016. It was then that she could have tried, after the referendum, to build a cross-party consensus on the way forward. The Prime Minister did not. The Prime Minister called a general election in June 2017. She lost her majority, knowing then she was leading a minority government. Again, she could have reached out across this House, and she did not. I'll give way to you. Friend for giving way. People outside of this chamber will rightly wonder what on earth is going on today, and rightly so. So can he confirm? Can he confirm for the benefit of my constituents and the rest of the country that this party has voted repeatedly for Brexit, but for a different deal? that supports and protects jobs and workers. And if the party opposite would move their red lines a bit, we could honour the results of that referendum, as we all want to do. Uh, Mr Speaker, for months and months, my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, the Shadow Brexit Secretary, and many, many others have set out to the Prime Minister, if only she would change her red lines, we could reach a consensus on the way forward. But rather than do that... The, I, I'll give way to him. I'm very grateful to uh, I'm very grateful to the honourable gentleman for giving way. Does he agree with me that what we've heard today from the Attorney General is an attempt to dress up political yes. shenanigans as a requirement to get a legal certainty, when in actual fact what they're trying to do 
is to solve the Tory party's political problems so they can usher in an unelected right-wing Prime Minister to negotiate... Order! Every honourable and right honourable member of this House must be heard. No attempt should be made to shout someone down, and if it is made, be in no doubt. It will fail. Joanna Cherry. Perhaps the honourable members opposite would like to go and join the mob outside. Yeah. My point is this. What this is about today, what this is about today is an attempt to solve their political problems and usher in a right-wing, unelected Tory Prime Minister to negotiate a Canada-style free trade agreement and a workers' rights-free Singapore-style economy. Well, the Honourable Lady, when we talk about political chicanery today, she's absolutely right, uh, Mr Speaker. And remember as well, today was a non-binding motion. I appreciate, Mr Speaker, you've not chosen any amendments, but even if you had, they wouldn't have been binding in any event, and the Government could have wriggled out of them in due course. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I, I'll give way to some. I'm an honourable friend for giving way. I'll take no lecture from the SNP that failed to vote for a customs union that could have created the conditions uh, for our compromise. But, but can my honourable friend confirm? Can my friend confirm that it is entirely conceivable? Yeah. Order far too much noise. The honourable gentleman must and will be heard, Jim McMahon. Thank you. It's entirely conceivable that this could be voted through today, but then when we are required to bring forward a meaningful vote, yep. the exact same legislation could be voted down. Exactly. What type of constitutional crisis does that create? Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right, and it is promoting uncertainty rather than providing certainty. I will give away to the honourable gentleman. I must make some progress. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to the honourable gentleman for giving way. It was the EU Council itself which separated these two strands yeah, right. of the process. Yeah. Both strands yes. have to be delivered. The letter which the Honourable Gentleman referred to from Presidents Tusk and Juncker, did not refer, whilst referring to both parts of the package, in no way suggested they had to be voted upon on the same day or simultaneously. Can I just put it gently to the Honourable Gentleman? He is dancing on the head of a pin to provide a fig leaf. Mr. Mr Speaker, the Honourable Gentleman should read Section 13 of the EU Withdrawal Act, which he voted for, which is very clear that the two documents have to be approved together. Mr Speaker, I, I, I'm going to make some progress. I'll make some progress. I've given way a number of times. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister signed off the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration in November. She was originally supposed to hold a meaningful vote on the 11th of December. Since the day she took the decision to abandon that vote, the day before it took place, 109 days have passed. She knew then that the deal was going to be defeated by a substantial margin, but she ploughed on. On the 15th of January, the Government suffered the biggest defeat in parliamentary history by a margin of 230 votes on the first meaningful vote. Two weeks later, on the 29th of January, the Prime Minister promised the House she would change the withdrawal agreement. What I am talking about, she said, is not a further exchange of letters, but a significant and legally binding change to the withdrawal agreement. Negotiating such a change will not be easy. It will involve reopening the withdrawal agreement. Now, Mr Speaker, at this state, late stage in negotiations, any withdrawal agreement would have required the backstop. It was always totally unrealistic for the Prime Minister to pretend she could drop the backstop entirely or make substantive changes to the withdrawal agreement. Yet she wasted weeks and weeks on this fruitless pursuit, including voting for the amendment in the name of the Right Honourable Member for Altrincham and Sale West, which required the Northern Ireland backstop to be replaced by alternative arrangements. Those arrangements have not been secured, and they could never have been secured. On the 12th of March, the Government suffered the fourth largest defeat in parliamentary history by a margin of 149 votes on the second meaningful vote. And now the Government, Mr Speaker, tries to carve out the withdrawal agreement in a last-ditch attempt to save a botched deal that has failed to even come close to commanding the support of a majority of this House. 
This Prime Minister has recklessly run down the clock. She knows her deal is unacceptable and she has failed time and time again to listen and to change course. Mr Speaker, too often this government has ignored motions of this House. It took Parliament to fight for a meaningful vote on the two documents, the withdrawal agreement and the political declaration, to be considered together. To suggest that they should be considered separately now is to go back on what the government has been saying about the importance of the link between them for months and months. I'll give way to my honourable friend. Um, I, th I thank my honourable friend for giving way. As always, he is giving a fine. Uh, performance of the dispatch box highlighting the Labour Party's position. But could I seek from him two points of clarity? As was made clear by my honourable friend from Ashfield, the Labour Party has put forward on numerous occasions what we consider to be an acceptable form of Brexit. Could he confirm for me, if the Prime Minister were to relent on her red lines and accept that form of Brexit, and the Labour Party were to consider that acceptable, would the Labour Party still consider that deal requiring a confirmatory vote in the public. Oh, and secondly, on the 12th of April, when this deal failed this evening, our choice will be no deal or a lengthy extension. Could he outline for me what length of extension the Labour Party will be seeking and for what purpose? The, the, the purpose of the extension is always the critical issue. And let me just say in respect of the issue, of a comprehender. Mr. Seeley, calm yourself. Your attempt to intervene was politely rejected. You don't holler across the chamber, man. Yeah. Calm yourself. <laughs> Zen. Nick Thomas Simmons. Yeah. Say to my honourable friend, we've been putting the idea of a comprehensive customs union for months and months and months. The reason it is being properly considered is because of the Prime Minister, nothing to do with the opposition. And we, let me be clear today, Mr. Speaker. We will never mortgage all our futures on the outcome of a Conservative leadership party contest over which most members of this House have no control at all and would have to sit back and watch. Without the clarity and protections we need in the political declaration, we should not approve this withdrawal agreement. Mr. Today's vote is a shoddy gimmick from a desperate government that is trying to hide away from the reality that this House would still need to bring the meaningful vote in the form of the political declaration and the withdrawal agreement back to this House. The Prime Minister's deal for months and months has simply created division and discord when we need a consensus on the way forward. The national interest, Mr Speaker, is in building a consensus for a future that protects the jobs and livelihoods of all our constituents, and that's why the House should reject this motion today.